Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the FMA Discussion. This is episode 458, and today we have Michael Blackgrave, who's come highly touted, um, always heard about him, Jaime, good friend Jaime has always spoken highly of him and that, so uh, I'm humbled and honored that he wants to come on the show and talk to us. So we're going to be talking about a bunch of things, his journey, uh, FMA-related, Wing Chun, why he thinks it's so valuable. We've been looking at that as well as his training with Yuli Romo and KI. And as anybody knows, I'm a huge KI fan. So we're going to hear about his aspect of that, his uh, system, SEMA. We're going to go over that and what that entails, what it's about, what it fully encompasses in there. So if you're watching, tell us where you're watching from, smash that like button. And if you have questions for Mike, please put them in the right hand comment section. I will get them. However, though, if the questions that are coming in, if they're not really relevant to what we're talking about, I don't want to disrupt the flow. So, but I will get to them. And if by some reason, there's not enough time to get to them. I will definitely ask Mike if he wouldn't mind answering maybe on Messenger and all that. So without further ado, here he is, Mr. Blackgrave. Hello, hello, hello. Hey, everybody. How are you? How you doing? Well, yeah, I'm doing fantastic. Doing good. Again, I appreciate you coming on. I've heard nothing but fantastic things about you, so uh, I'm excited for this. And uh, and I know you took a nice, healthy break from social media, and now you're back, strong as yeah. ever, in many different facets of your life. It seems like based on the yeah. test run. So, oh yeah. So what up? So let's get into, you know, like your beginning martial arts career, and then we'll segue into all the good stuff. But like, what was it? When did you start and what did you start with? I started way back in southern Indiana with my father, my late father. Uh, he was 101st Airborne Recondo. Mm. Uh, and he came out of the service and he always, you know, maintained his what they called combat judo back in those days. It was the airborne self-defense. And I remember it wasn't. A day that went by when I've got 11 or 12 years of age, come out in the backyard. Okay. Next thing you know, I'm, I'm being ta taught a uh, hip toss. Yeah. You know, come out in the backyard. Next thing you know, he's showing me a karate chop. And dad used to, uh, we had an old elm tree and pop used to just wear a groove out on that thing. Cause yeah, I mean, he had these huge hand size, 17 ring fingers, scared the hell out of you. And it, it was like that. That's how he started. You know, he would say, if somebody grabs you, this is what you do. And, he was one of them old type of guys that was very, very practical and always put that into me. And he basically told me, he said, son, you know, if you mind your manners, you keep your nose out of people's business and you keep yourself clean. You're very seldom in life ever have to use any of this. And I found that to be true. But he was also the type of guy, he says, when the odds overwhelm you, pick up an old club. And <laughs> just, get, and just <laughs> That's the way he taught me. And he was my first trainer in uh, hand to hand, my first trainer in how to use a baseball bat. Wow. First trainer and how to use guns, all that type of stuff. So from Pop, uh, you know, I, I learned from him and I wrestled a little bit in high school and stuff like that. And then when I got in the service, you know, that's where the, the martial art opened its doors to me. Because, you know, being from southern Indiana, that whole town at that time had maybe 8,000 people, maybe 20,000 in the county. It was a little mm -hmm. farm town. And so when I got in the Army... I started meeting guys from New York City, of course, you know, guys from Hawaii, guys from Cleveland, guys from cities who had access to martial arts. Mm. And I started training with a uh, friend of mine in the Army named Scott Latuski out of, I believe he was Cleveland, and he was a uh, black belt in Goju Karate. So I started training with him, and he was showing me basic things. That's where I started boxing was in the Army, and I got pretty good at boxing. We fought smokers, amateur stuff, and uh, had another friend uh, – Narcelito from Hawaii. He was a Kaju Kembo and an Arnese guy. So he would show me stuff like that. And, you know, back in those days, I didn't have enough time every day to go train because being in the Army, sometimes I was pulling duties in different times, different stations, all these things. But that's where I started. And when I got out, uh, I came to San Antonio and I uh, started training with Gary Swan in Chinese Kempo. And mm -hmm. not too many know of Gary, but he, he's a legend in the Chinese Kempo game. He was one of Stephen Labounty's guys. And you know who Stephen Labounty was? He was no joke. So I, st I studied with Gary for quite a while. And then, uh, you know, life took me different directions. And so what I was basically doing was putting everything together for myself at that point. Now, because I was a, such a big guy, 
Mm-hmm. I always liked bouncing. And so I got into bouncing. And then from bouncing, I got into a little bit of bodyguard work in the adult industry. And then I also got into uh, bounty hunting. I bounty hunted for years. And all that, you know, it, it paid, it's paid its dividends. And then uh, basically from there, I had this a fixation with Peter Urban. I don't know if you remember Osensei Peter Urban from USA Goju. Uh, that means when I was a kid, Peter I used to get all the karate magazines that he was in. Because this guy was a cigarette smoker, kind of a solid guy, Navy guy. So I figured, well, hell, if this guy can do it, so can I. Yeah. And then sure enough, in San Antonio one day, uh, one of his top black belts, Kiyoshi Wright, moved to San Antonio, Texas, and he opened up a small dojo. And once I saw USA Goju, I realized it was Peter Urban lineage, and I immediately went there. And the story goes as simple. I was a real cocky individual then. I mean, I was big. I was strong. I was fast. I didn't think nobody could put me on my butt. Mm. And I went into the school, and Kyoshi Wright wasn't a real big guy, maybe, you know, 5'11", 175, but he was from Bedford-Stuyvesant, New York City. So he grew up pretty tough, and he was already getting ready to retire. He had been to war, uh, the first Iraq war and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, he said I was very cocky, and he didn't. He wasn't sure if he wanted me as a student or not. And I was mm-hmm. kind of taken aback by that. And he asked me if I wanted to spar. And I was like, okay, let's fight, right? Yeah. It wasn't 25 seconds, and he hit me with a crescent kick, broke my nose, and dropped me. Oh, I'm laying on the ground in blood, and he picks me up. He goes, you okay, son? I literally asked him. I literally told him this. I said, where do I sign? <laughs> sign and, I, and I started to because I realized that very second that my butt that I thought was Mr. In- Invincible, it yeah. wasn't. And I stayed with him for, gosh, eight or nine years and uh, earned my need on rank, my second degree black belt rank. And I, that's where I started fighting. I was fighting as a goju guy in all types of ipon kumites, knockout kumites, uh, kyokushin kumites. I fought in all kinds of stuff. And then uh, a situation happened to me when I was bouncing in the clubs. I got stabbed. Ooh. I got stabbed really bad in the chest with a uh, cut down pick, and I never even saw it coming. And that started opening my eyes that I really didn't know what to do with a blade against the blade if anything like that ever happened and I, I didn't see this one but if i saw it i was kind of clueless you know because when you got into a lot of the japanese karate they had the old well this will work or this will work or the cross work. Yeah, yeah and i'm thinking to myself i don't know about that yeah that's when i discovered uh pikiti tertia uh, and i started training pikiti tertia here in san antonio first with uh gabe martinez and I, that's where i knew dustin denson from I trained with Tim Wade. Uh, mm. One of my main instructors who promoted me was not only Mr. Wade, but also Ricky Riera to La Canguru. I met Leo Gahe. I trained quite a bit when Leo was around. I hung out with Leo. I learned quite a bit. And that opened my eyes to the Filipino ways. While I enjoyed Bikini Tertia, I didn't like a lot of the politics. Mm. So slowly but surely, I started looking for other, because I don't play politics. I, I'm not good at it. I'm not the most, uh, I don't have the most decorum when people try to dictate to me in a dogmatic fashion what I can and can't do. I That's know. when I discovered Wing Chun. Uh, and then I noticed Wing Chun had a lot of the same uh, things that you do in, in the uh, Filipino arts, but I always gravitated to it more because it was a lot of striking involved with it. So I got into that. Uh, I started in the Leong Ting lineage. Then I trained with Sifu Scott Baker and the Tom Hoon Fan, and then the, also the Yung Kei San lineage. And at that time is when I wanted to go train in Illustrissimo because I'd always read about it. And uh, mm-hmm. Guru Ricky always told me about it. He had never trained it, but he told me all about it. And I would do, I bought, bought books and I looked up stuff. And, uh, you know, I had gotten married by that time to my wife, who was Filipino at the time. And she told me, she advised me to contact these people. And I did. I contacted Yuli directly. And I told him, I'll be on flight so and so. I'll be landing so and so. Come and pick me up. <laughs> So and I went to the you, Philippines by myself for, and I trained with a man for 28 or 29 days. And we yeah. were sometimes working 10 hour days. And we went to, started in Leyte or started in Manila, went to Rizal Park, went to all those parks and we trained, we trained. Then we went to uh, Leyte, we trained in Oromoc, we trained at Tacloban. Yuli would train you anywhere. He would train you in the hotel room. Look, this is a bed. This is what you do around an obstacle. Okay. We would go get uh, fish or we'd go get cacao coffee. Look, Michael, this isn't a crowd. Look what you do here. Okay, let's, let's go. Then from there, uh, we even trained on the Sanpan boat going from 
Leite over to Ponson Comotes, the tiny little island. You only had electricity three hours a day. And when we got to Pilar, that little island, yeah. we trekking in the water, on the beach, on the pier, in the yard, on the rockways, in the mango groves. We trained everywhere. And I came to the point, I was so frustrated by what he was teaching me because it was so simple, but my mind was looking for complex. But what he was teaching was so simple. And I got frustrated. Master Yuli looked at me one day. He said, tomorrow you take off and you just go play with it on the beach. And I was on that beach eight or nine hours. I came back sunburned. And then I gave it another shot. And then I started getting it. And I started getting it. And I started getting it. And I started flowing. The lutans, the floats, the different, you know, trancadas, all these different methods. They just opened up to me. And uh, mm -hmm. next thing you know, I came back with it. And uh, he, pr he promoted me to Punong Guru because I got it so well. Almost 280 private hours I trained with him. That's a lot. Not quite a bit. That's a lot. Yeah. And then when I, mean, I brought it, when I brought it back, before I started teaching it, I took another year to really, really get it down. Yeah. And then I started sparring guys in different systems. And, and ever since then, then I started putting my own spin, my CMOX spin on it with uh, other things that I had trained that I knew fit in. And I just had to change a little bit. And from that point there, then I discovered more Wing Chun. And that's when I started seeing that the Wing Chun and the Illustrissimo was one. It is like this. Yeah, it's a sister. I mean, they they flow. So if Tatang never did Wing Chun, I'd be surprised. Because the way a lot of the stuff that he moves and the way he uses his hands and all these different things and the way he moves his body and it shifts in his steps, I'm like, wow, that is so, so similar. So similar. Interesting, interesting. interesting. So when you... You know, you're you're doing combatives with your father. You segue mm -hmm. into traditional martial arts, Chinese Kempo, Japanese, and then you bridged into FMA. Like right off, like what was like really different when you got into FMA initially through the Biki lens versus everything you did before that? Like what really stuck out? The fluency. Because mm. Pikiti Tersh is very fluid. Uh Gojuru. There's differences. There's Japanese Gojuru and there's Okinawan Gojuru. Okinawan Gojuru is very more upright. It flows more because it wasn't so much designed for the hard kumite fighting. It was more self-defense. Mm. In the Japanese, you go to lower stances. There's more emphasis on ipon kumite, on big power. On It's more rigid. It's more linear. My hardest part coming from that to the, to the uh, Filipino martial arts was actually softening myself gotcha. to ingrain the flow because in being a big man in karate, it was right up my alley. Uh, like Professor Urban said, my God, you're so big. He said, grab him and hit him. You know, <laughs> but yeah, exactly. Because, you know, it was hand to hand. And there's a lot of that I still implement to this day, but now I understand fluency. But that same mindset against the Filipino guy with a blade or anybody with a blade gets you killed. You know, because now if I, if I grab you and stop you from moving, who else am I stopping from moving? Me. There you go. And so I just had to break out of that fluid fluidity uh, or lack of fluidity from Goju to that. My father's hand-to-hand -hand combat that he taught me was very, very guttural. Son, if a guy grabs you, boom, palm him. If mm -hmm. a guy bear hugs you, boom, grab his nuts and walk away. That type of stuff. It was very, very guttural. Stuff that, you know, you would be taught in the Army to, to learn quick. Uh, but it wasn't until I really got to master Yuli that I understood flow. That man mm. taught me how to flow. That man is the one who taught me to really move for me. And that's one thing I love about him. Uh, I see a lot of Kali Elastissimo, you know, from all the, the, the five pillars they would call, you know, Ray Galang and uh, Christopher Ricketts and all these guys, Edgar and uh, I can't remember the other guy's name. Tony Diego. Uh, and Tony Diego. Yeah. All those guys are really, really good. But none of them move like Yuli did. No, he was unique. He is still and, unique. I shouldn't say. And that's one of the reasons why I chose him because that uniqueness was something I needed in my motion. And he's the one who taught me tiny little abierta serrata drills, closing, opening drills, how to step with it, how to fire off a rear shoulder by closing that shoulder, how to step and reopen a shoulder. All these little things. I was like, wow. So he taught me how to flow and how to move and how to mm -hmm. stay simple in what I'm doing and how to. Just be concise. So now when I spar guys, uh, stick spar, the only time I'm moving is if you make me move. Other than that, I'm just waiting for you. And that was one That's of the really things about Neil Tatang. That's so interesting you brought this up because 
this is not the first time this has come up with regards to ki and other fma systems where you're move while you're moving you're in position like why are you moving you're in position like why yeah. you know so that's that's profound because this is not the first time yeah. like my lameco teacher david gould would say that like why are you moving you're you're in position and nothing's happening right now why yeah and because i think we've been still in us the footwork you got to move 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 yeah. and over and over moving yeah a lot and a lot of times also what i like about the ki is that very first move of retriada where it's the right rear 45 and you close the shoulder with that with that what they call fraction fraction yeah. one and if you get that down and you can play at that largo range anytime you step back and pop that hand when you start to move in you're attacking in that medio. So many systems use that medium ground to either bridge in or bridge out. Mm -hmm. What KI does is that is your meat and potato, that medium ground. The way Yuli taught me is once I'm in that medium ground, I can do it, I can go where, where I need to go or I can stay right there. And if you notice a lot of KI, it's a lot about body shifting as opposed to body to stepping. There's a lot of shifting involved. And yeah. Yuli was a master of shifting. You would be oh, on top of it yeah. and he yeah. could shift. And you're just like, wow, where'd he go? You know, is, is that type of stuff. That's why I sought him out. And totally make, no, I'm, everything you're saying is resonating with me. And, um, you know, where you're finding gaps, perhaps your own with the relation to Bogota. In other words, if you're way, if you're ranging out too far, how are you going to capitalize on Praxion? Because you just ranged out too far, where, much to your point, yeah. the body shifting and having the opportunity while simultaneously dealing with the threat. Um, yeah. And, you know, Yuli also would teach retriada. I don't know if you uh, know what retriada is. I'm sorry, uh, what was it again? Retriada. Yeah, retreat set. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and when he would retriada, uh, he would teach you a double baston. And when you retriada, it's here, boom. And then when you step back in, it's here. When you step mm. back out, it's here. When you step back in, it's here. The right foot's the only one moving. Right foot out, boom, right foot in. That's retriada. And then when you do a single stick, it's it's just it's almost like a, a reverse redondo, you know what I'm saying? And with just those that type of movement right there, you can just frustrate guys because you never you, they never think you're there because you're always moving back. And then when they're trying to come in, you crash them. And then by the time they're trying to crash you, you're back out. And it, and it's not these huge hits; it's fraction, bap bap bap, just short hits, short hits. But as Tatang said, it was a blade art. Now you put a sharp Bowie knife in your hand or a sharp barong in your hand. You're lobbing things off. Each hit is lobbing something off. I don't have to cut all the way through. It's just, yeah, exactly. there goes a finger, you know? It's, it's yeah, like an index finger or thumb. I mean, there yeah. you go. Like getting, exactly. So how was he, now, did he instill right with you also the Engano, the in-between and everything? Uh, yeah, Engano was big, and Engano was the bait. And, uh, yeah, you know, bait, people, yeah. don't, people don't know a lot about Yuli, you know, that him and I became very, very close, and, you know, we, we matter of fact, him and I were talking last night, and uh, oh, good. I'm going to be probably going back over there soon to see him. You know, he's getting older, I'm getting older, might as well. And uh, we were talking about, you know, what he calls his, I think, hoopas or something like that. I said, oh, and Ganyo, baiting. You know, yeah. Yuli was really good with the feint, almost like a boxer. His empty hands were crazy because he would he would be leading with this hand, you'd come in and he'd pow, and he'd crack you with a slap knuckle down on your hand or whatever. But he was baiting here, next thing you know, he's here. And I remember in uh, Pilar, we were playing one time, just empty hand slap boxing, playing around. And I did something wrong, and I really stepped in karate style. And he stepped on my leg, jumped around, and got on my back and forced me to the ground. And it was like he was getting ready to rain elbows. And I was like, wow. You know, he was small. He was really lift back then. Yeah. And it was amazing how quick it was, too. And it was, it was, kind of, it was spooky. And he would talk about Tatang, how Tatang would do empty hands. Tatang would go. Tap his knee and then tap his shoe. Because Tatang used to walk around with a pair of wooden sole shoes that he would sharpen on the edges. Yuli's got a scar, I believe it's on his right leg, where Tatang skip kicked him wow. with that sharpened shoe. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So he that's, would always, he said that was Tatang. Boom, 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 bang, bang. And that's how he would do it. He would just crack you. You know, it's really pretty incredible. Stuff. Like, I watch, because I do online training with them. I'm, I'm due to get back. And now things are slowing down the holidays, online training with them. It's just amazing. How he's moving in his seventies now, um, yeah. Like, and imagine yeah. him earlier. I mean, his movement is none like none other. I mean, he's just. See, that's the thing, you know. I always talk to him uh, when we we had some really deep uh, conversations in Komotas over breakfast. You know, real early in the morning, we'd be talking and stuff, and he would tell me that uh, 
nobody understood. Most people mimic Ta Tang as an old man. Mm, so yeah. That's why you see a lot of the uprightness. When Ta Tang was real old, you see a lot of the uprightness. Mm. Yuli said, very few people know how Ta Tang moved when he was young. Can you imagine how Ta Tang was moving at 30? I can't. That's scary. For me, matter of fact, me and Burton have talked about During World War II, how he was moving? You know, yeah. and, and I'm a firm believer that Tatang had much, much more in his arsenal than what people gave him credit for, just due to the fact of his career. He was a merchant marine for yeah. years and years and years. Of the now, docks too. Yeah. Yeah. Think about all the guys he probably met. Oh, you do this, I do this. Let's have a beer and trade. Yeah. Or when he was in Indonesia, in port in Indonesia, uh, martial artists are martial artists, no matter what era. Guys were always going to find the other guys to train with or trade secrets with and stuff like that mm -hmm. so when i look at tatang moving as an old man which is phenomenal i would love to have seen him when he was 28 29 or 30. i bet it i bet it was something to see oh scary just you know i think yeah. he was he was physically gifted i mean long mm -hmm. arms there i mean like he could exploit gaps just by i mean you're looking at edgar and yuli short i mean yeah he would, you know he could just tee off the salto to their head when he was mm -hmm. you know what I mean? but uh I think also his fight IQ, I think it was off the charts. You know, what I mean? and I, I, I think he was psychological in ways that people didn't understand. Mm. And he was serious about his psychology. A lot of guys, uh, you know, they would say, "Oh, you a stick fight?" He would throw a blade at you on your feet. Let's fight. And he wasn't he wasn't joking around when yeah. he threw the blade at you and said, "If you want to fight me, take you know fight me with a blade." He wasn't joking. Mm. Tatang had taken people's lives. There's a real big difference when you've taken somebody's life. Yeah. And the real McCoy and just sparred your whole life or had big stick fights. Ta yeah, Tong, exactly. let's be honest, Ta Tong was a killer, man. That and that and World War II made him that. You only yeah. you really introduced me to so many of these guys like that. I remember when I was on Ponson with Yuli, one day he was taking me out to this crazy lake that was supposed to be enchanted, haunted. I said, Okay, let's go. I, I'm down for that. And when we got there, there was a little house in the corner. And there was an old Filipino couple. And oddly enough, the woman spoke fluent English because she was originally from Seattle. And after the war, she ended up staying there because she was a nurse who went over there. Oh, okay. she, and she married a man by the name of Vic Sanchez. And Vic Sanchez was nobody of notoriety. But mm. Yuli found him to be very credible when it came to fighting arts. And at that time already, he was an old, old man because you know he had fought in World War II with the Bolo Brigades and all these things. And the old man came doddering out. And, you know, he was hard hearing. So Yuli, would, hey, Tang, you know, they called him Tang Tang, old man. And he would tell him, tell me about, you know, World War II. And I, ah, I don't want to talk about it. And then Yuli asked him, who was your teacher in Arnis? And the old man looked at him. He goes, teacher? He goes, World War II taught me. Yeah, World War II. <laughs> and, and then he said, can you show me, can you show uh, my friend Michael something with the bolo? And Yuli handed him a bolo. And for that split second, he became 22 again. <laughs> And I was just like, whoa. And he was the one. Then he started talking to us about the triangle. Mm. And he said, those people don't understand the triangle isn't this. He goes, it was three of us. One went this way and cut him. One went this way. One took the head on to the next because we didn't have guns. They had guns. Right. So we had to come here, here, and here. And then he laid. He gave the, uh, bo the bolo back to Yuli, turned around. And doddered back inside and went and sat in his rocking chair and started rocking. He just wife, went back and, to his age. Yeah. And his wife said, oh, please, please forgive him. He's a very old man. And I was, I'll never forget that as long as they live. That's the one story out of the Philip, my Philippine adventure that just resonates with me to this very day. That is freaking incredible. And I, I think it could have been Yuli, but I def, Vic Sanchez, that, that name definitely. Now there, there's, uh, there's another him. Vic Sanchez who's really, really popular. I think he's out of modern Arnis. They called him the Filipino Elvis. I think his name is Vic Sanchez, but this this was a different guy. He was a little old man. Oh, maybe okay. Maybe I'm okay. Yeah. I could, maybe that's the guy. Okay. Um, so back to Ki. Um, it doesn't take much to talk on Ki. Um, what did you in you know not to put one down or not? You know, both obviously everything has its value. What did you see? Like you're going Piketty and and then to Ki. For the folks who are watching, like, what was some of the differences that you recognized for comparing contrast between the two? I believe uh, KI is simpler, and I believe KI is easier to put into combat than Pekiti Tersha was for me. 
I True. saw a lot of stuff of Petiti Thursa that I looked at and I went, man, I don't know about all that. I, I don't know. If, I don't know if you're going to get that off. I don't. It, I don't know. But Ki was just so so simple and so direct. It was just about winning. Everything at Ki was about winning. But when mm. I saw Petiti Thursa, I saw. You know, maybe it was the people who taught me in that, in that first level, there was 60 things. And then, then over here, there was 30 things over here. There was 20. Th and I'm, I'm not the type of guy who learns that way. That's one of the reasons I left American Kempo at Brown Belt. We went from 10 techniques to one year. Next thing you know, each belt level's got 26 techniques. Yeah, now when you get up to your Brown Belt, you got 42 techniques per stripe, seven yeah. sets. And I'm like, what? I, I mean, yeah, I don't know. That I can't. So yeah, for me, it was, out. it was that. Like, that was a good thing. Good things, like, and get, you know, get the concepts, yeah. have some techniques to illustrate the concepts, and just get good at, like, in which yeah. KI, that's why KI resume. Mean, nothing I have anything against Bikini. I don't. Yeah, I, I mean, there's nothing I, got against I didn't like a lot of the politics that always were played. I, did, I didn't that's like tough. That. That's a tough arena over there with the politics. And yeah. so I just, you know, and, and I, I know a lot of stuff that happened in Bikini world that I just keep to myself. And I just felt I was better off leaving it. They're trying to sit there and coalesce to all the bull that was going on. And I, it, it just wasn't for me. I didn't see it working for me. I didn't, I didn't want to sit there and invest all that time into something that literally confused the hell out of me. I mean, the way that I was taught it, you know, these, I mean, everything was just so many emotions to get to one thing, just go, you know, just go. <laughs> just go. Yeah, just I, I mean, I don't understand this to that to this to that to this to that to that to yeah. that. And everything was tippity tappity tippity. Everybody playing with each other, playing with each other. And I was thinking to myself, why don't I just hit the guy? <laughs> and you know, in illustrissimo, the, the way Yuli taught me, he goes, hit, hit him, hit. Yeah, because that's, oh, what, hit him. that's what illustrissimo did to all those guys when they were yeah. young and all that. He was freaking yeah. hit, hitting them. Those guys were going home bruised and. Oh. I tell you what, my first one of my first lessons and on Ponson with him, uh, I, I had that Pikiti Tursa toe tap stuff that they do, you know, the toes in front. Mm -hmm. You know how they constantly do that. I tell you what, I never had more blood bruises up my left leg than ever before. All he did was in Gagno, pow, ooh, man, just catching me until I finally realized, what are you doing putting that out there for him to hit? And so, you know, he was until I got it, he just bap, 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 and just tore yeah, me up with it. Gagno, like, yeah, whatever's gonna be, whatever there's for the taking. Yeah, I mean, but you, when you were training Bikini back, wait, I mean, you were probably getting more of what the Dose Methodos. Um, yeah, I was getting uh, the Dose was... Methodos. I started, I think it was, I don't I can't remember what they call it, the 42 or something like that, or the 20. I can't remember what they called it. We did the Dose Methodos and a little bit of the, uh, Tri V stuff. Every time Leo always had something different, something new coming in. And uh, you know, is Leo good? Yeah, Leo is really, really good. Is Tim, all those guys are really, really good. But you know, I think a lot of times you have to have that mindset to learn it that way. And, I, and that's just not me. I don't have that patience. No, it is. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's a good point. Was it patience with me? Like I was exposed to some of the Dose methodos, and then I went to Tri V, and um. And so I'm doing this, and then I go to see uh, like David Gould Lameko, which KI is a huge chunk of Lameko, and basically is like, why are you moving? <laughs> I, mean, like, I mean, like, you're in position. I mean, you know, so yeah, I guess for different folks, but again, nothing gets PTK. I, I no, mean, nothing at all. Just some of those guys, some of those guys are resonating. Really you, know? you know, I think it's individual, but, you know, like exactly. you said. Exactly. But when I spar PTK guys now, I just uh, yeah, pretty much fraction, step back, fraction. And if you, yeah. if you crash me, just fraction, step back. Yeah, fraction, you know. fraction, fraction, yep. fraction. Exactly. <laughs> it's so simple, you know. That's awesome, though. You're going to kind of re – I think that's great. You're going to reconnect with him over there. Yeah, I mean – Yeah, that's we, we talked sure. a lot last night, and like I said, uh, he's in his 70s now. I'm 60. And, uh, you know, I, I plan on being here till about, I promised my daughter I'd be here till about 102. So, I mean, I got 42 more years to learn. So I'm, I'm ready. So you got to, you got to, yeah, you got four more decades to uh, refine yep. your KI. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And like I said, I don't teach it to everybody. Yeah. Uh, I've taught it. I've taught it. Uh, I taught my CMA. I call it CMA KI because I, like I said, I built, Yuli always encouraged to build it for yourself. And take what you need and put it in there. And if there's something from someplace else, he always was like that with me. He goes, you know, you're a big man, Michael. Do do what fits you because you're very, very big. And I was like, yeah. yeah. 
And so I do a lot of, I, I put a lot of goju work into mine, that energy. I, my, it blends with my Wing Chun and literally my Wing Chun and my, everything I've ever done is now one. It's just one. And I use the Wing Chun moniker because I teach, I teach empty hands before I teach weaponry. Because we're living in a society where empty hands should be your very first go-to. Yeah, instead of going to. Yeah, because I just can't. If it, you know as well as I do, Dean. If somebody grabs me and I pull a blade and I shank them, bye bye, Mike. You're going away. So exactly. So my whole thing is, you know, I incorporated my boxing on the ground. I incorporated my BJJ. I incorporated the catch, uh, yeah. the, the judo that I know. Uh, Everything, the Wing Chun on your back, everything is now, I'm just trying to incorporate one. And I play with my guys and find out where things work on the ground and where things don't work on the ground. Find out where yeah. things work on the feet and don't work. And if they don't work, we pitch it and get it, get rid of it. That's why my Wing Chun so different. I don't believe in uh, the 19 hands that they call 18, 19 hands most traditionals teach. If you're going to need 19 hands, you're full of shit. I, I teach usually seven basic hands. And those seven are what you're going to probably end up using. But as a, as a guy in the street and a Wing Chun guy, uh, you should be hitting. If you know as a grown man it's about to go down and this guy's about to go off, then you should be hitting. You, you know, hitting. we'll, we'll yeah, deal yeah. with the, the repercussions after the fact, you know. Wow. Joel, Joel has a question, and it actually yeah. it's, it's in Wing Chun. So his question is, how important are bridging systems like Wing Chun for developing fighting skills for self-protection, but also – dealing with edge weapons that's joel's question uh first off wing chun isn't a bridging system okay wing chun is a hitting system the okay. only time the only I'm time these hands you. should come out bong sao tan sao pak pak gums all these things the only time those should ever come out is if you are behind the timing and that meaning i'm attacked boom here if i can't get a shot off i, I should immediately be able to go to a high time or if a guy's grabbing me out of nowhere, I should be able to go to a bong to break him off and then start hitting. So it's a hitting set system. The bridging is a secondary trait of it. As, as it pertains to the knife, it's fantastic. Uh, you'll see it in a lot of Filipino arts, they'll knife tap. Yeah. Well, we take that one step higher. Our knife, we don't knife tap. We use what we call the double gun. So if you stab here, this as this comes here, this hits the head. It, is it, now, if you come to this one here, I come with a Kwan Sao and I blast into the body or to the head, but I'm here. If you come over here, I can now Pak Sao and hit again. So we work those type of drills off of any type of stab. We'll, mm -hmm. We can literally, and every one of our bridges is a hit. The Bong Sao is just not a bridge. If I'm going to Bong, bang, I Bong, I hit, right? If I'm going to raise the Bong, boom, I'll hit. If I'm going to Tan Sao here, right, and I'm going to hit at the same time, I'm just not putting this up there. I'm striking with it. Because when most people make a bad habit, especially guys who don't train, when they throw a hook punch, they like to roll the knuckles down. And so they give you this right here, and they give you this uh, nerve right here. So mm. I'm, I'm targeting that arm and trying to break into that. And that's that two-bone theory on one-bone theory. Bang! And anything, then you just keep going in from there. So Wing Chun as a striking system, and we got beautiful stomps and kicks as well. It, it's and about hitting. seem to be overlooked. Oh, they, yeah. 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 Yeah, the kick, we're, we're not one of those guys, we don't snap kick. We do yeah. in my, my wing chunk because of the goju background. But a lot of this, our stomping work or our chi girk work comes out of grappling. If you hook up with me here, I'm immediately going to start looking at my feet to start breaking into ankles, start breaking into shins, start breaking into knees with stomps, mm. and then taking you down with that. Because the way we look at it is our chi girk is the way to put you on the ground. Our leg work puts you on the ground. So here's a question for you. And, and kind of the with relation to what Joel was talking about the bridge and is Joel maybe asked in that context because maybe that's what he's seeing out there there's a lot of bridging going on as opposed there's to a what lot you're of, saying uh, Wing Chun is Wing Chun is one of those uh, methodologies that there's people who stay strictly lineage mm -hmm. and then there's people like myself who take it and play with it and make it their own and all my seafoods I've ever had also did that uh sifu baker he, he added a hawaiian lua to his he matter of fact he fought in the first couple ultimate fightings with wing chun and lua and boxing and he put that together sifu wow. carroll my sifu now in alabama not only is he a sima ki guy via me he's a great wing chun guy he's a really good boxer and he comes out of the wally j small circle 
Okay. And so, and then he's done some catch wrestling too. So we're the type of a group that believes that motion is motion. Mm. We don't own it. We hone it. If we can make it work within the context like of, of uh, familiarity, what flows together goes together. That's what we do. And, but there's, there's a lot of people who don't do that. There's a lot of people who in Wing Chun only think they punch is here. That's, that's not us. We have see a lot of reference points. In other words, and I'm not saying I'm right. I'm saying what I'm exposed to via social media. I'm seeing a lot of reference points and how, as opposed to what you're saying, like, man, hit, I'm doing this because I was late. You know what I mean? Or whatever, you know? Yeah. And the same thing when they set up Mansa Wusa, you'll see a lot of guys set up here like Mansa Wusa, Mansa seeking hand, Wusa backing hand or guarding hand. They'll set up this very traditional old school way. Our Mansa Wusa is real simple. Right, right here. You know, so you got the jab if you need it. You got the cross. You got the hooks. You got all those punches, when you train the forms, they're all there. You just have to be able to see them, decipher them, break them down, and build on them. They're all there. Wing Chun, mm. I'm, I'm with the WCBA, which is Sifu Carroll, or Sigong Carroll's uh, or the Wing Chun Boxing Association. Okay. So our footwork is wider. Our footwork is more boxing-oriented. Yeah, we do do the arrow steps. We have all the traditional wing stun stuff that we teach, but we break it in context and we make it fit people. We don't make people fit it. Because if I try to do that, all we're going to do is get robots who can't make robots. it work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so I got guys who are five foot seven and they're really fast, but they're real thick and they can't, you know, they can't get elbow to center quite, you know, quite like I can or whatever. So we work mm. it around them. So these guys immediately can start using their Wing Chun if they needed to use it. And even the wording that uh, the Wing Chun, uh, you know, the names for the forms, we have different meanings from them. My, my Seagong's wife is from China. And we asked her one time, and I laughed my butt off. I said, uh, Sifu said, or Seagong said, honey, tell them what the word Sidom Tao, the first form means. Everybody said it means little springtime, right? Okay. And she said, no, it means quit thinking. Quit thinking. Okay. Yeah. And then she, I asked her, they asked, we asked her what Tom Q meant. And, she, and he, you know, most people said it, it's the bridging, right? And she goes, no, that means to destroy a bridge, to destroy it. Drum, destroy it. Mm. I was like, wow. And then I asked her, I said, uh, well, then what does bilgi? Because everybody thinks the bilgi form, the name bilgi means thrusting fingers. And she said, oh, no, no, no. She goes, that's a dirty word. I can't say that. And, and Sifu said, go ahead and tell him. She goes, it's the oh, fuck form. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Due to the fact that it goes against the principles of the other two. Yeah. And it's that form that literally, you, ah, you know, you're under severe duress and you got to start doing dirty, nasty things. And then when we started talking to some of the, like Duncan and all these guys, they would tell us basically that we teach the forms backwards here. We teach them backwards here that, you know, if you really wanted to, it's one complete form. Mm. And you open with you open with the bilgi because you're opening the body. And then you go into the chum gotcha. because now you're getting ready to close the body. And then you do sinom tau because now you're shutting the body down meditatively. And so mm. they say we got it backwards. And so I teach I teach the form first three, back to three, but I teach it as one form. We're going to start here. And we're going to continue through it until you're done with all three. And that now you're done with your form. Yeah. And plus, it's good condition. We got Jaime here. Jaime, I, I'm, I'm, all right, folks, I'm sorry I'm lacking on looking at the comments because this has been so interesting. I'm just making sure I have not missed any questions. And so far, so good. So we have Jaime. <laughs> uh, Mike, holding back 7%, still hits like a freaking horse. I remember the best disarm is a blunt force trauma disarm. All right. That's from mm -hmm. Jaime. Coach. True. Danny, what's Coach Danny saying here? Coach Danny is saying, yeah, the standard training is about learning and practicing position and feeling. Then the practitioner practitioner should spar and figure out how to function for itself. Can I? Okay. Well, I mean, yeah, there, that's all. That, that's all. That's all fine, with Danny. I agree with him. I don't disagree. But you, yeah. everybody's different. You got you got to understand your student. You have to assess your student's ability you have to assess your uh, student's timidity all these type of things when i get i get people who come to me that i've never thrown a punch in their life never in their life yeah. and I, now i got to get them from a a to a b and it's taken some students that i've had a long long time so if i did, if i if i start driving them too heavily 
and start putting too much here in their mind, mm -hmm. what happens to them? They fall apart. You know, and you can, uh, sparring is a great thing, but let me tell you something. If you spar too quickly, you're going to lose students. People are going to get, people are going to. Oh, 100%, man. Look at FMA, man. Oh, hey, guys, mark on the class. Okay, get to retain. <laughs> yeah, yeah people go. Because not everybody is the same person. Yeah, you're going to lose. And, and here's the other thing I'll tell you about sparring. Sparring is a bad habit building machine. It's a great, it, it, it's a it. great habit building machine, but it's a bad habit building machine. All right, let's hear it. Let's hear it. Because a lot of times, everything that you learn in any system, I don't care if it's boxing, if it's wrestling, if it's jujitsu, if it's Brazilian jujitsu, whatever, if you take it in there and you start putting ego, you start putting people in, you're in great shape, he's not in great shape, right? You start putting those things in there, you start putting will and desire in there or mm. a lack thereof in there, it all goes up in smoke. Why? Because nobody is on that same equal level. And when ego starts to play a part in it, and I don't care what anybody says, ego plays a part in it. We're all oh, human nice. beings. We're all infallible. I saw it in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I saw guys who were great purple belts with a big-ass ego smashing white belts because they could. What do you think yeah. happened to those white belts? Yeah, they left. <laughs> they left. Yeah. I also saw the other thing around. I saw white belts coming in who were D2 wrestlers smashing the shit out of brown belts and smashing the shit out of purple belts and just totally taking those guys apart because they were d2 wrestlers and big and strong and fast wearing a white belt and so should they have should that sparring really have taken place this guy just came out of college and is in great shape yeah this guy is a purple belt 52 years old a little bit yeah, chubby, not in the best of shape. he's a hobby goer <laughs> so this is where you start building these bad habits you've got to be able to assess students and find out what students want. Yeah, you have to find out what your student wants. If you, if my student doesn't want to uh, hit the wall bag a thousand times because he has a shoulder injury or because his hands hurt, should I make him hit it a thousand times? You know? I know that's true. Like, hey, how about asking what they're here for and what they exactly. want and what they want to get out of it? Like, imagine that. Like, you're actually making the student the focal point. Jeez. Exactly. You know, there are uh, so many instructors make it about themselves. When I was young instructor, I did. I was horrible. It was all about Mike. It was it was it was about Mike showing what Mike knew, how Mike could move, how Mike could do this. I lost a lot of students that way. And then all of a sudden I started getting older and started getting my ass handed right. to me when I went and trained with other people and I realized, ah, it's not about Mike. It's about the student. Because guess yeah. what? They're the ones paying you. That, yeah, you know, that there's it's their journey. Like they get one journey, yeah. man. You know what? That's why I can't stand like e these ego guys or these mm -hmm. guys. It's about me and the system and the founder and all this. Um, no, yeah. actually, you're irrelevant compared to the student body. Exactly. <laughs> and here, the other thing I've always found about that, if your people that you train aren't enjoying their time with you, yeah. they're not going to stay. They're going to go somewhere else. 100%. And I have a lot of people say, well, then get rid of them. They ain't worth a damn. No. They're not hard. They're not a warrior. They're not a Viking. Cliche, yeah, whatever. Not a warrior. I, I, I've got no time for that. I, I, I got no time for that. No, I, I love your I love your philosophy. Exactly. Man. It's about the student. And yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want to have a revolving door and lose students and they leave and they talk about their experience, which is, wasn't positive. I mean, yeah, that's yeah. going to really resonate for you and future students. <laughs> out, of, out of 100 people through your door. You'll be lucky if you find three that are hardcore. Three. Today, I, I today it's it's a different time, it's different type of people. It's this. Totally. And we can we can lament about, oh, they're soft, oh, they're this, oh, they're that. Well, you know, guess what, man? That that's just, that's just juvenile. You know, we are in 2024. This is the way it is, right? So you know, I've had to I've had to tell my mother that so many times who's 80 something, and she doesn't understand why my daughter is doing computer homework. Or yeah. all this stuff. And I tell mom, I say, look, it's 2024. If she does, this is the way they do it. Going forward in her life, it's going to be an automated world with all these things. If she's so far behind the curve, what's her chance? And it's the same with martial arts. If you can't evolve with the time, um, you're not, you're not, yeah, you're not going to have, and you're not going to get better. You're not going to be really doing well on any no. level. Uh, no. Anything, yeah. Not at all. No, music's my ears. I mean, I, I I concur with you and agree with you. I'm just making sure we haven't missed any questions. Um, okay. Um, okay. 
with okay let's get into this knife culture man like we were touching you know how the importance of vetting students just when you're teaching knife or empty hand against knife just the, mm -hmm. the ethical obligation integrity of self honesty to the student body um what say you about uh edge weapon training specifically the knife well i like it i i, I see it differently than most though I don't, uh, I've been stabbed. I've been stabbed on a few occasions in my life, unfortunately. So I understand what it's like to be hit. And I understand what it's like to use a knife on somebody. So I, I look at it from the, these two aspects. My life wasn't always nice, Mike. I was a very rough individual for 15 years of my life with looking at serious consequences for some of my actions. And I understand that uh, a lot of what's being taught is not what's going down. It's, it's just not. I mean... Uh, you know, Tatang said it best, the knife should be felt and not seen. Mm -hmm. And that's that was my experience is when I was hit. And when I hit, nobody saw it coming. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to sit there and go jets and the sharks, da, 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 all these types of things. That's that's a fallacy. That's an ego builder. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have does it have merit. Yeah, it's got merit because you never know if something happens where you have to get something there. But let me be honest with you. No, even if you get something there and you're still hit with a with a blade. Brother, there's stuff that goes on in here and in here. I can't imagine. Yeah, totally. Yeah. When I got hit here, I was bleeding so bad. It dropped my lung. And I immediately was, uh, and I was seeing that dark blood like we talked about the other day. And I knew I was in trouble because I could see the dark blood. And I understood that. And I couldn't breathe. And I see this guy coming at me with that freaking cut down blade or that punch. And all I could do for the life of me was push him away. And thank God other bouncers and people got in a way yeah. to take him down. And I tell people all the time, you have no clue what you're talking about. About You know, I've had people, you should have fought through that, really. Oh, you know, the, there's a lot of ego involved where people are actually out there looking for this martial art war. They're, they're yeah. hoping like hell that one day they can use their piquiti tap or they can use their this or they can use their whatever it is. It doesn't go that way, man. It just doesn't go that way. Oh, tapping, 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 uh, tapping. And not only that, but guess what? Even if you use that blade, right? Now mm. you got another battle on your hands. Because now you got to prove it was legal. You got to prove that you felt for your life legally defensible. Good luck. Good luck. Because there's something called forensics experts at DAs yeah. that can come out there for and a tell reason. You <laughs> which 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 puncture wound killed him? How long was he alive before this? They, they know all this stuff now. So when you use that blade on somebody, brother, you better be lock solid, airtight on what you did and why you did it. Yeah. Because, you know, in our culture, a blade has that stigma to it. It does. And yeah. If you More than me, I'm six foot, I'm six five, 255, 260 pounds, covered with tattoos with a past. Yeah, and, right. And you're you're gonna be scrutinized, man. You're gonna be and you crazy. know for a fact it's not gonna be a jury of your peers. Because <laughs> no. if it was a jury of my peers, it would be Dean and Jaime and Court and all those guys like me. But no, they're gonna get Miss Gladys Kravitz over here who's yeah. anti everything. That's how it works. And now yeah. I'm, I'm fighting up a hill for my freedom yeah. because I didn't know how to either de escalate, get out of there, not be there. Yeah. Or whatever it's going to be. So I teach when I teach knife stuff, like I said, I teach very few people knife stuff. And I start most people with the Wing Chun uh, double knives, the big knives. Nice. Just because, you know, it's, you know, you're learning the form, you're learning all the different hits with it and stuff. And then we'll break it down into other things. But I always tell them it's, it's a, uh, in case of war, break glass type of stuff. I don't put a lot of that stuff out there because I don't need somebody knocking on my door again. I've had that happen yeah. twice. Which gets into the vetting, our responsibilities and instructors to really vet people before you take them in just because oh, yeah. they're good. And, yeah, uh, and I mean, I've seen people, uh, well, I used to teach knife courses. There'd be 15, 20 guys. Hell, I didn't know three of them. Then I'd be like, oh, man. I know. I don't know. And now when I teach like the KI stuff, uh, it's, I only, I'm only teaching – one guy KI right now because it's, it's weapon based and I don't need that hassle. And even with him, I know him, but I don't know him. You know what I mean? I know him, but I got to really get to know him before I break it out. And it's just nowadays in this, in this world today, you've got to be so careful because there's people out there. They want to put guys like me and guys like you away. Yeah. That's the same with guns. I don't teach guns to everybody either. I do a lot of gun work, 
And I have a select group that I teach stuff to that I trust. But outside of that, man, I don't put gun stuff up that's, you know, really, you know, yeah, I don't do that because, man, I, I just, I've seen it too much where people get that knock on the door. Like I said, I'm a single father to a 15-year-old daughter. If I'm gone locked up somewhere. Yeah, right. Who's going to we're, we're gonna take care of her? Exactly. exactly. You know? So so by the way, I look at life is knife stuff is, is good, to lo- good, good to know, good to learn. It's mm-hmm. fun to learn all these different things. But you have to put it into a real reality perspective, man. You just have to. Mm-hmm. So many guys are wanting it to happen, and I guarantee you, after it happens to them, they'll never want it again. Um, statistics, as far as a metric system, or folks that like we're mm-hmm. watch, we're we're watching some videos that weren't watching, but you know, but still though, there's always gonna be cracks. You know what I mean? Sure. You, know, you know? Yeah, yeah. I saw that video, and you know, he's correct. You know, your statistics may say this, yeah. and I believe those statistics. But you just never know when somebody blows a loop. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and uh, I I don't I don't wish I don't want anybody to to take what I've shown them and all of a sudden, hey, who taught you that, Mike Blackrain? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Blackrain, yeah. come here. And you know, you damn sure know they're going to do it. You yeah, know? you're going to be no, I yeah I I agree with everything. That's, that's why I'm that's why I love Wing Chun, boxing, jujitsu, yeah. all these empty hand things, because yeah. like we talked about the other day. As, an, as a regular guy, as a regular citizen, as a father, or whatever it is, when I'm out there with my kid, we have protocols. I tell her, if this happens, we need to do this, this, and this. We follow that. But she, I also understand that as a good person, I don't walk around like this. I don't walk around with my blade. I'm going to be, for the most part, second in the equation of the violence because I'm not starting nothing. Yeah. I'm 60 years old. I have zero to prove. You can call me anything you want to call me. You yeah. can whatever you want to do. That's water off a duck's back. So more than likely, I'm going to be second in the equation, meaning behind that timing. So hence yeah. the empty hands. If I don't have solid, rock solid empty hands to get to a tool that I may need, mm. what good is the tool? And that's one of the reasons why I love Wing Chun, because it gives me that ability. Anything. If you look at the the Sinom Tao form, there's a piece built into the form that's a weapons check. Okay. You know, it's a weapons check around the midsection. And I teach it that way too. I teach it with that modern approach. Okay, what, what can I what can I be reaching for here? We'll do yeah, the yeah, uh, yeah. what some people call chi sao here. You know how we chi sao? That's pun sao. That's rolling hands. Sometimes we'll put a blue gun on you and a blue gun on me, or a, a training knife on you and a training knife on me, and we'll go into that equal 50-50 pun mm. sao. You can go for your weapon. I have to try to shut you down. If I go for mine, I have, you nice. have to try to oh. shut me down before I get it. And you will be surprised. And how much you can't do. It's like amazing. That. And it doesn't matter what level you're at. And we I had a buddy of mine, um, uh, real good gun guy. And uh he had this bad habit of doing this to go to his gun, both hands. So as soon as he would go to his and I see both hands move, pow, 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 pow. Yeah. You start hitting him. And all of a sudden they're like, Oh, holy crap. So we do rolling hand poon style with training weapons on us and to see if you can get to it without being shut down with a shot to the chest. And we hit to the chest. You know, so we don't break the guy's face. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And it, I tell you what, it's an eye opener, man. It's an eye I opener. I like that. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, uh, trying to get drawn or resistance or just an obstacle mm-hmm. obstruction or whatever it yeah. may be. Yeah. No, I, it, it, I think it that. works. Um, so, what, um, let's just before we talk about your system and what inspired you to do that. Okay. So, Medusa, you, uh, what do you think about these prison systems? You know, like, um, you know, I know Medusa. You're obviously well up there, one of the first ones. And and then uh, I guess we'll like you're you're you had some exposure to Piper. Mm-hmm. So your friends on prison systems and are they truly worth to look at? Uh, I, I I the whole idea of a prison system is kind of to me just kind of ad hoc. You know what I mean? It's it's mm-hmm. it, 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 it's it's a it's a shanking implement. Uh, most of these guys are going to try to run game on you. Uh, I was a prison guard for years and I saw most guys are running game to, to get what they need to get. You know, uh, like when I was working down here at the hut, these guys would run two and three on you. You know what I mean? They get you this way. They would talk to you this way. And a guy would come up and just grab pop, pop, pop and run. Wow. So is that a prison system or is that they're more opportunistic than a system? Yeah. Yeah. I guess they want, you know, and that, yeah. that's the way I always saw stuff. And, uh, you know, Medusa, you know, it has it has its uh, strong points that, you know, the grabbing and the hitting and all that stuff. 
and the shocking and the latching and all these different things. That's fine and dandy and it's good. And I, I you know, I would go to it if I needed to. But there's one thing about that. If if I'm grabbing you, what else am I latching? Mm. Me. Yeah. You know, you're creating a- and, and, and when you're in that close proximity, that your your weapon's out for a reason, right? Why would your why would your knife more than likely be out? Because he's got one too. You know what I mean? That 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 makes sense because here again we go back to the, the civilian. If I shock and latch you and I got a blade and I start pumping you, you don't have nothing in your hand, what happens? You're going, yeah, you're done. You're exactly. Going. So we have to break out of the mentality that we're doing a prison system. We're a prisoner. Because now all you're doing is imprisoning this. If you if you think to yourself that you are acting as a prisoner yeah. against an unarmed man. And that's where I see a lot of these systems against somebody unarmed. No, no. There, I, yeah, definitely on that. I look at like, you know, you know, stuff for like, God forbid somebody breaks my house and all that, but they have the whole advocation of like sure, uh, sure. prison and, and all that. So I always look to extract, but, mm. and I look at it as a platform. Like, I think it's a platform, a system. Yep. No, yeah. platform, so you know? I, I always look at it this way here. Uh, let me grab my bedside buoy and you do those same things to me when I'm facing you. Yeah. <laughs> fraction, pap, fraction, pap, fraction, pap. Yeah. Anything you come in with, I'm chopping down. Yeah, and yeah. So I, I look at it that way. And I, like I said, I'm in Texas. I'm a gun guy. You break in my house at night, you're more than likely you're going to be. You guys, I know you guys can get away with it. It's the nine millimeter <laughs> carbine time, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. So, the as, as you know, as to what they do, I don't have a problem with, it. I mean, there's some validity in it, but that whole prison mindset, you know, I guess maybe my experience as a prison guard, I don't see it as a system. I just see it. It's opportunistic as hell. Yeah. You know, same with Piper. I saw it. It's very opportunistic. I don't quite understand all this shimmering and all that. Yeah, I don't quite shimmering. understand all that. Uh, me personally, if I'm going to grab a blade, I'm going to grab the damn thing. And if we're going to get busy, we're going to get busy. I don't need to shimmer and shake and, Oh, I don't even. I really don't understand what that is. Why? The shimmer's why a language it. thing. So it's 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 a language thing, distracting, intimidation. If they want to rob the person, for example, creating uh, momentum off this. But for our, but here's the thing, though. Much to your point, the language aspect down there. But but in relation to us Westerners, the shimmer is going to be like, why the hell are you? Why, why we're not going to be shimmering? You much no. your point. Yeah, well, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna grab I'm gonna, that. Uh, beautiful Williams blade design and I'm going to grab it and pick all and I'm going to just hit with it. You know, that's, mm-hmm. that's very simple. Knife work. <laughs> you don't have to have, be honest with you. You don't have to have a knife system to be good with a knife. No, no. You know? yeah, 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 yeah. You can take a crackhead with a screwdriver and the opportunity, opportunity. The knife is opportunistic. It's an ambush weapon. As I said, I'm not dueling anybody with a knife. No. You have a knife. I have a knife. Guess what? The only thing you're cutting on me is my ass. Cause I'm going that way. I am not too old to run. Like I said, I've been hit three times in my life. No, no thanks. That's no the thing, thing too. Like we, it's like this glorification from th- through theater, or cinema, and where we're supposed to like. No, man. Someone pulls a knife, and you whether you have one or not. What's your first thing to do? Assuming you want to protect loved ones, you get out of there. Like, yeah, get something between you. Get a car between you. Yeah. Grab if, if you could get to a trash can, anything to keep that blade from touching your skin. And if you look around the world, every you'll see guys, we play what we call a pit game. And I learned this from my buddy in South Africa, Mark Human, and it's a pit game. And it's basically, you know, where they're here and they're just trying. And if you think about that, that crazy ass pit game shuts down system left, right, and center because it's so guttural. It's so different compared to a system that has you know lines and rules and this and that mm-hmm. and you're cutting here and you're going here a pit game is just try to hammer you and mm-hmm. that that's a hard thing to deal with especially if it's yeah. with a machete you know something where they got the length to it and you can see that in all types of countries man in yeah, South, Latin America Philippines everywhere yeah. and you know so I, I look at the blade as uh nah now nah, I don't I, I love blade work and I collect knives I have a lot of beautiful knives I carry a knife but uh, that's the last thing I want to get into is, is a freaking knife fight. Oh, my God. I know. Like, yeah, I want to look at it. I do it for attribute development, recognition, sure. reaction. And, it, and it's oh, fun. Yeah, yeah, it's fun, too. Right. But, yeah, but I don't take that model of training and having fun and building attributes to, like, this This is what yeah, I'm doing this because one day I will be in a knife fight or, or seeking that, the glorification of that. It's just, yeah. 
Brian right. Canada the other day he had a little video out, and I didn't even see the blade in his hand. He had a little tiny blade palm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he was just walking around, and he went bang. And I and I wrote back to him. I said, "That's the reality. If somebody really wants you with a blade, you may not even see the blade. They're just walking um, by you, bang, right in the right in the side of the neck." And I said, "And I that's the reality. If, if people want you with a blade." They're not going to say, hey, you, pull your knife. I'll pull my knife. Let's no. play. No. They're going to distract you. Distract yeah. you. Yeah, exactly. You, getting... Yuli said the same thing. He said, in the knife work in the Philippines, he said, we all look the same over here. <laughs> he said, yeah. they'll come up behind you and pop up, stick you twice in the back, drop it, and blend into the crowd. I know. It got glorified like this. Dueling. and Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah no. And wow. even the great Jim Bowie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, who dealt? Who who dueled the guy, and he got all messed up himself. He may have won it, they say, but it ended his life. Yeah, eventually. but he didn't go home unscathed. You know? no. <laughs> I ain't got time to take a court uh, a cane sword in my liver or something. Screw that. Oh my gosh. You know? So let's get in your system. So what was the yeah. inspiration like, and the, you know why you called your system the name it is, and what does it embody? Yeah. CMOX, simple, effective, adaptive methods of combate, and I use the K combate. Uh, okay. you know, just homage to my wife's uh, fa family and all that in the Philippines. And, and and it's exactly what it is. Every is. I've been studying, it'll be 46 years in February. Everything I've ever studied is within the CMOC uh, way of doing things. Okay. It's very, very simple. There's not a whole lot on any level. There's five levels. And, and it just basically breaks down into how to stop a shot, how to deliver shots. How to deliver kick, a left 45, a right 45, a weave, a pull, jabs. It's just basic, simple things that can be transcending across systems. I could take, you could take the CMOX level one and put mm. it into your Kempo, put it into this. And it's just th those basics as I see them that comes from basically Kempo, American Kempo, Gojuru, hand to hand from my father, uh, KI, and Wing Chun. And I, and I just built it off those five things. And it's just very, very simple, and it's adaptive, and it just transcends what you want it to go into. Here again, I don't teach a whole lot of people that because so many people in the game, they're looking for complexity. They're looking for the magical mystery tour. Yeah. And I'm just, the, I'm not your guy if that's what you're looking for. Because a lot of people, you know, they my, my guy Dusty who comes to me now, he goes, damn, Sifu. And I, I don't even go by titles. He calls me that. I, I just go by Mike. Yeah. I'm not a big title guy. Thing, and, he goes, and he goes, uh, he goes, I didn't realize training with you sometimes can be really, really boring. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, because guess what? Like the last night before Christmas, all we did on the wooden dummy is work turning the horse, pox styling, pox styling the top limbs, pop, 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 pox mm -hmm. just working, turning the horse, popping the hips, popping the shoulder, boom, extensions. And he was like, we did that for an hour and 20 minutes. Yeah. I said, guess yeah. what? No, now you got it. But now, now you're like, look how much better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, said, if I just sit there and teach willy nilly and try to teach you the whole farm. Yeah, I said it doesn't yeah. do that. So CMOC is an umbrella. You know, underneath the CMOC, you have the Wing Chun, you have the KI, you have mm. the gun work, you have the grappling, you have this. It, it's the umbrella of what I do, and everything just raindrops underneath it. Huh, that's kind of like my thing, Blade Tech. It's an umbrella, yeah. and under that, there's systems yeah. that are in there, but it's really an umbrella. Huh, I like that. Yeah, and so, people, and if, so if people want to come to me and just learn the long pole. I'll teach them a long pole. Yeah, same. Yeah, right, right. You know, if they want to learn a uh, little grappling, my my idea of grappling, I'll teach them that too. You know, it, so awesome. I'm not one of those guys to say you have to come to me for the whole complete system. Yeah, right. You can, if you want a component, I'll give you the component. You yeah, I mean? exactly. Yeah. And, that, no, and for me, that's yeah, just like, that, that's a simpler way to do things. I totally agree. Like, why should somebody like do the whole thing? To extract one thing they really came for that they, they wanted to get from you. you know I mean? mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I, I had a guy who kept coming to me for privates who wanted to uh, just better his health. Yeah. And so I started doing, uh, then I started pulling out the Pikiti footwork, the triangle drills, and I had him moving. I put there all you go. There, there's a workout. In Sawzall. And I, yeah, exactly. I started having him do stuff like that. And then I taught him a lot of the, Isoflex yoga type of stuff I do, and he ended up losing seventy five pounds. Oh, that's awesome! There, there is interested it. in anything fighting. He just asked me if I could help him. I said, yeah. sure. Come on that's by. awesome! Awesome! Wow! You know? So, your system. So, like, okay, so you got five levels. Um, mm -hmm. So, if somebody wanted to, 
they just they they were enjoying everything they were seeing from you they wanted to get the whole system so they have five levels and is there i guess what you would deem as an instructor yeah I, I usually just I, you know being western or i say apprentice instructor instructor that's it you know and and, and i give a, if you want a piece of paper i'll give you that or if you want a t-shirt i'll give you that too yeah, that's what Yuli told me. He goes, Michael, do you want the certificate of the T-shirt? And I said, I like that T-shirt. The T-shirt. <laughs> yeah, I got a badass Punan Guru T-shirt that he had made for me in the Philippines. <laughs> I, I'm the not, I mean, I got I got paperwork and I got certificates and rank, and they're in a file somewhere. I, do, I don't pay much credence to that. I just don't. Uh, uh, you know, my name's Mike. My name's not Seafood. My name's not. No, Steven. I was born Dean. I'm Dean. Yeah, exactly. You know? I'm just a guy who knows a lot of cool stuff that likes to help people. And, Let's have fun. Yeah, I know the fun. That's the whole yeah. thing too. Like when you start, like especially because I train mostly because edge wise. God forbid somebody attacks sure. whatever. But but I don't get so deep into it where I lose the aspect of fun and creativity and making it enjoyable. Where it's like, yeah. okay, guys, we got to prepare for this. If we don't, you know, we when you turn around a corner, make. I mean, you know, not yeah. getting over hyper vigilant and with all this stuff yeah. and making messes at students because yeah. now they're getting paranoia exactly exactly <laughs> and, it, and and life is far far too short for all of that you know it's just uh you know have fun with it man because like my dad taught me if you keep your nose clean you mind your business you stay out of the bars you're a decent human being your chances of ever mm. having to defend yourself to that level are slim and none yeah. I mean, I have been in, I mean, I've been in a lot of situations because I put myself in those situations. Okay. I was one of those guys who was looking for it when I was younger. I was in that mm. life. I was doing criminal activity. I was always looking for it. I wanted to, I had that chip on my shoulder for years. And guess what? It finds you. It finds you. It'll find you real quick. <laughs> but, you know, since I got right, and my late wife is the one who really helped me out a lot of that stuff. And I'm to the point now at 60 years of age, man. My idea of a fun night in is watching a good movie with my daughter, laughing and having a big cheeseburger with her. Nice. I know, you know I'm boring. I have online I chess, do. online I'm backgammon boring. for me. I'm, yeah, I'm I think a game of chess would be great, man. I, I mean, I like a cup of coffee, game of chess. I'm good. That's what I mean. I'm I'm like pretty I'm pretty boring. Yeah. <laughs> um awesome, awesome. So what um here's um you know, I saw a couple of videos before you took your break uh, from social media and you were doing clinch stuff. I, I thought it was just fascinating. And what you were doing was you had either it was a plum. I want to say it was a plum or overhook. One of, the, one of the two. But you were finding while you would give him something to think about and then you're coming with something else, keeping his mind occupied on whether you're kind of moving. Him. I don't remember exactly. Mm -hmm. But what I saw, I really liked. So you on clinch. Yeah, I, I, being a big man, I love holding and hitting. And as I love holding and hitting, there's a lot. That's where a lot of my Wing Chun comes in and real, real tight. So when I, where a lot of times guys will come straight in here and they'll clinch collar and elbow. What mm. I like to do first, uh, before I come in and I grab the back of the head, I like to crack that shoulder. Boom, here. And once I crack that shoulder, doing, I spin the oh, body. You were doing, yeah. you were doing that. You were doing co single collar tie and something with this. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, punt, I'll, I'll, I'll hook that arm here and suck it in, pop that shoulder. And after I pop that shoulder, in the in the competition circles I was called for for cheating, instead of going to the back of the head, I'll bring the shotai, pang, to the side of the head, and then I'll snap down. Mm. And so you're actually getting a little shot in there. And then from there, it's just a step through and either a hip throw, or as soon as I hit that, I can drop down, double leg, pick up, drive, knee on belly, pop, 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 pop punch. So the there's a lot of little stuff like that. Uh, the Lansau elbow. Ah. And we're here, boom, that's Lansau, right? So a lot of times when you come in, collar and elbow, I'll hook up here. Well, once I get this here, now nah, that head's not going anywhere. And then mm. once I start turning the horse, where does my Lansau go? Bang, here. And so I'm going to start hitting the shoulder, start driving that into the arm, boom, bang, bang. Mm. I'll tell you what, man, you start breaking people's arms down. And if I wanted to be an ass, you could jerk down and hit the head. But, you know, competition, I didn't do that. Yeah, right. Was, I was called a lot of times for bringing what we call the fuxiao. And I would go beyond and now I'd snap the fuxiao into the back of the neck. Pow! Yeah. The, yeah. So why in porn still, like some folks, um, I think they neglect clinch. Um, mm -hmm. um, it's hard work if you get somebody that knows what they're doing, overhooks, underhooks. I mean, the plum, mm -hmm. the this and that, the transitions they're in. Mm -hmm. But to me, clinch is critical. It's very critical. So ground fighter starts with the clinch. Yeah. 
ground fighting starts in the clinch. So you got to have a clinch game because you never know when. Now the clinch game to me, like I said, you got you got the competition clinch, right? Well, what happens if somebody my size drives your ass up against the wall? Essentially, you're in into what they call the clinch game, correct? Yeah, if you're I would in that clinch game at that point. What happens now? And if you don't have anything, and if you don't have anything, you're caught. And if you're caught, you're done. So the clinch game doesn't just work standing. It has to also be a clinch game from the bottom. You have to have a clinch game from a side control because you're still clinching, even though you're on the ground. You're still clinching now. So even with all that, without a clinch game, you can literally, uh, especially against a guy who's any type of a wrestler. You get a D1 guy and tell me, good luck, man, if you don't have a clinch game. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and the thing is, you cannot play their game. I'm not a D1 guy. No, either. If, no, if you clinch with me, I'm going to start striking, yeah. uh, grabbing, uh, ripping, tearing, all those things I have to do. And that was one of my problems when I was studying uh, BJJ, which was so sport-oriented. Man, there was a lot of times, like in competitions, I picked up a guy, we were in the clinch, and he said he was a young guy, maybe 28, real big. And, you know, they, they dropped me at the time I was 58, and I couldn't find a match in my age category, so they put me oh, in this. Okay. <clears throat> and I'm a big guy. He was a big guy. And he said something. He whispered in my ear in the clinch, and he said, what are you going to do, Grandpa? Pissed me off. And so I, I dropped down, did a double, and I got so pissed, I ran across two mats, picked them up, and spiked him. And then I'm thinking, oh, shit, yeah, you can't do that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, we, and, it, and it happened a few times. I spiked the guy outside the ring. He pissed me off. I can guarantee you, though, you won't be saying grandpa to anybody anymore. No, no, no. no. After that, he apologized. He goes, oh, yeah. Well, you know, I, just, I apologize for spiking you on your head, but it is yeah. what it is. You know, so yeah, so clinch though. Amen, man. You you might not like it, but you better navigate those waters, God forbid. You, right? you have to be solid everywhere. You have to have some kind of ground component, get up component. Just because you have a ground component doesn't mean you have a get up component. You mm -hmm. gotta build that. And with with all that, there's only one way you to build that. You have to be fit enough to build it. You have yeah. to be strong enough to build it. Because mm -hmm. I can tell you what, you start grappling and you get into a clinch. Air sucks out of you quick, wow. brother. Oh, isn't that so demanding? Holy yeah. crap, man. You could, you know, I was, when I got into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, I was one of those guys I was running at the time four or five miles every day, six days a week, right? Wow. And I had great cardio. I mean, I mean, I have great cardio. But when I got on that mat, I started realizing my cardio sucks because it wasn't geared towards that. Yeah. So I started gearing it towards that. And then I realized I got, I, I had ran all the way down to 228 pounds, right? thinking I was tall, I was lean, I was fast, I was strong. Brother, I was having trouble because I was too light. And my right. cardio was so so run-oriented. And when you run too much, that, that what they call that static uh, cardio, you start to, you know, you start to put that estrogen in that, you know, you're not that strong. Yeah. And then I said, you know what, let me fix this. And so I started doing more aerodyne bike, short burst bike riding on mm. my uh, road bike and started doing power lifting. And my jujitsu game took off after that. I got bigger. Nice. I was like, okay, I can, I can breathe, you know. So if you're not in shape, I don't care who you are, man. You get on the ground with somebody, and if you're not, in shape, oh my god, it's go. worse. Your diaphragm starts. Oh, it's the oh. worst. <laughs> it's the worst. Yep, yep. Cramp city, buddy. And then once yeah. that happens, a lot of there's a lot of quit going on down there. Yeah. Like we said yesterday, just because you get on the ground and somebody's putting it on you. And you think you just because you tap or say you had enough, and you're gonna res, you're gonna think that this guy's gonna let you up in the street. Don't go that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you yeah, gotta yeah. have a way, you not only a ground component, you gotta have a get up component. Yeah, absolutely. I had to get up, safe, right, and and also on the ground too. Like, like I mm -hmm. like I teach monitoring hands. Like I'm not in the sport, sure. man. Like, where are your hands are? Are you reaching for your pockets? You're not giving me money. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's where that grip strength comes in that's why i tell a lot of people i do the old, remember the old uh captains of crush those yeah, 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 yeah. i've got uh i can close the number two which is 197 pounds and i had to work up to that but i tell you what when i first got into uh because i love the gi and jujitsu my mm -hmm. fingers took a beating because you know you think you might be strong in your fingers until you start to work against that live resistance grabbing that gi man i don't know how many finger pops finger pulls, finger breaks. And then I started actually working 
hand drills, you know, tennis balls, all kinds of stuff. Mm. Like hands really strong. And that means something because, like you said, monitoring hands. If I'm on my back and I see a guy going for it, and if I can grab that wrist and really get that wrist and make you have to think about this and have to really work to get re- loose on that, it gives yeah. me the option to do something else as well. No, no argument here. I mean, uh, nope. yeah, like, you know, because, I mean, I'm – going to be in a year and a quarter be 60 like I'm, I'm not gonna be rolling around with a young cat playing J- bjj rules no 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 that's one like i said I, with my bjj injuries that's what that's what stopped me from progressing all the way to purple brown and all yeah. that so neck injuries and I, like i said i got a 50, 15 year old girl i'm raising she doesn't need me shitting in a bag yeah you can't be in a wheelchair right no nope. wheeling around i mean nope. which leads me to next smart like one of the things i in the test run you're talking about i thought was fantastic for folks around our age or maybe have a few injuries and what have you is the intelligent training so like what do you have to say for folks like <laughs> the first thing I t- i'm going to tell everybody is intermittent fasting really Intermittent fasting. I, uh, I've tried diet. I've, I've had weight issues my whole life. Mm. My whole life, I had weight issues. I would be real, real heavy, and then I would diet it all off and just to gain it all back because I would crash diet and fad diet and all that. And until when after I, my wife got sick and passed, I ate my way to 336 pounds. And I knew this time that I could not. I don't have enough time left in my life to sit there and, and play the weight yo-yo. I just don't because the more... Every time I put on all the fat, my health went down. You know, mm-hmm. one of these times you never know when it's going to go completely cattywampus. Mm-hmm. So I started investigating uh, uh, intermittent fasting, and I still do sixteen eight every day, seven days a week. What's sixteen that now? hours. 15, my eight. last meal will be at six thirty. I won't eat again until ten thirty the next morning. Oh, and in that okay. eight hour window, I watch what I eat. There's nothing I don't eat, but I don't suck back a ton of donuts and all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. During yeah. the holidays, my mom bakes all this great stuff. So, yeah, I, I indulge. But then usually I'm eating real, real clean. I do a lot of proteins. I, I do really, really clean supplements. Uh, and as far as exercise goes, I tell people, stretch. Mm. I got into DDP yoga, Diamond Dallas Page. That was my start into yoga. And that stuff, <clears throat> believe it or not, saved my life. Because everything that was hurting, quit hurting. And then from there, I got into different yogas like Ashtanga, Iyengar. And I worked for years and years. I got thousands of hours of training, not with only DDP system, but with my teacher Gebhard in New Braunfels in Ashtanga, Kai Lewis in Houston. And I finally got certified for my 200-hour certification to teach. Oh, nice. Congrats. And that takes like 1,000 hours worth of training. And uh, then I put my own little program. I call it. I call it my battle yoga. It's more of an isoflex. I mix isometrics mm. with the flexibility. And every morning, seven days a week, a minimum of thirty minutes, man, to open my body. Because the older we get, we get all those little aches and pains. Mm. I may wake up sore, but as soon as I do my isoflex, dude, I'm ready to go. And then from there, mm. I start my day. Whether it's nice. going to be lifting, cardio, walking. Uh, something, you know, and it's usually like today I did chest. I do the old Mike mentor, chest, shoulders, and triceps. I like to lift a little heavier because lifting heavy is good for the body. It's good for the bones. I'm not talking mm. 600 pound benches and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, I'm talking yeah, yeah. nice, thick weight. And that way there you can, you can maintain muscle mass. That's the critical thing as we age is maintaining muscle mass. The maintaining. Then, also, you have to understand expectations. What is your expectation? What are you lifting for? Mm. I'm, I'm lifting to be a healthier, stronger, better man. I'm yeah. lifting. My lifting has to incorporate into my martial ability. So for me to sit there and try to deadlift 700 pounds does me no good. My deadlift mm. is 335. Yeah, wow. You know, and I, I'm gonna. I'm shooting for a 350. That ain't. I'm good. I don't need all that uh, ego lifting type of stuff because my goal is. I'm a big man already. I'm six five. I'm 260, 255. Yeah. So my whole thing is you have to find out what works for you and consistency, consistency. Back and if to you're not fasting. consistent, you're trouble. Back to the fasting. I'm interested in this. So when you say 16, eight, I mean, so like, for instance, if I wanted to initiate this and start this, which I've never done, like, what would you recommend for me? I would start with you at 14, 10. So let's just say you eat your last meal at six o'clock tonight. Okay. Okay. So now count 14 hours. So six o'clock in the morning would be 12. Okay. Eight o'clock in the morning would be 14. So now you got your 14 hour fast in. 
So for now, for the next 10 hours, you you have you start to plan what you're going to eat. OK, like for me this morning, I had a flaxseed bread with raisin. I had my protein bar. I had my protein shake. I had an orange, a low fat yogurt and a banana. That was breakfast. OK, and now for lunch, a few hours later, I had a homemade bowl of chicken noodle soup, a big bowl. Mm. All right. And now tonight for supper. My mom does all the cooking since my wife passed. She's always over here cooking for us. So tonight we're talking. Nice. Uh, I think tonight we're doing salmon. So it'll be a big salad, a big salmon piece, a chunk of salmon or two, and probably some uh, sauteed green beans and onions and all that. And then if I do get hungry for a snack, I eat a lot of nuts, a lot of raisins, uh, oranges. Uh, and if I get a sweet tooth, I'm pretty good on that, man. A piece of nice chunk of dark chocolate, stuff like that. Or another yogurt, something that's not going to kill me and not mm. put fat on me. And then I, and once I'm done with that, I don't eat. Now for the next 14 or whatever hour cycle of fasting, you just don't eat. You can drink water and all that. That's fine. And then you just don't eat. And then ne next thing you know, your metabolism starts to kick in with fasting. Next thing you know, you're starting to, whoa, okay, this is this is looser. This is looser. This is looser. Mm. And, and, and as opposed to dieting, the first three letters of diet spell die. You know? <laughs> I stay away from that, man. That's I never thought of that. The first three, yeah, die. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't diet. Yeah, sign me up. <laughs> wow, interesting though. So fourteen. So all right. So tonight, if I, I'm gonna eat at six, and then from six to eight in the morning, nothing but maybe water. Yeah, and if you do get hungry for a snack because you're new, break out some fruit. And here's another thing you can do: break out if you got any like loose meat. You know what I mean? piece of chicken baked chicken protein yeah, protein yeah. protein 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 man yeah i know like i'm staying away from the car i'm trying really hard don't do that don't do that bad don't carbs. stay away I mean, from like good carbs. carbs stay away from shitty cars but not good carbs. yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the carbs bad. are your fuel so what good, good carbs to you are fruit i eat whole grain breads that are very very healthy organic whole grain breads it's very healthy okay. Uh, I eat potatoes, really good potatoes. Okay. I eat sweet potatoes. I eat vegetables. I eat uh, cheeses. Uh, sometimes if I'm hungry at night, man, I'll cut off a chunk of chicken breast, take me a piece of Swiss, wrap, Swiss, wrap that bad boy up, argh, tear it up, you know? <laughs> wow, it, it, wow. Hey, it beats the alternative, suck it back with a, you know, a box of candy corn. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. It's fucking down. A, yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like Skittles or something. <laughs> and I also start my mornings with coffee, you know, get that caffeine and you get that little bit of uh, get, get that metabolism kicking, you know, mm. and I use my good supplements and I'm off, man. I'm, I'm ready to work rock and roll. This has been awesome, man. I mean, I'm going to try this. Wow. wow. Cause I've always heard this intermittent fasting. I'm hearing more yeah. and more about it. Folks more and yeah, more. Go, go online, go on YouTube, man. There's some, that's how I learned about it. There's some fantastic videos on it. Yeah. You know? oh, I bet. I and bet. Like I said, uh, lift strong push-ups, all kinds. And you know, and, and here's the other thing. Enjoy the idea that you're looking good naked, brother. Cause that's the key. <laughs> <laughs> I, tell you, I know it's, it's a bad, bonus, but, it, but it matters. It matters. That's you know? funny. And the side bonus will be you will look better. <laughs> it's true. I it's did. true. And that, that that can't be a bad thing. I I I don't think so. I I have to agree. I got a question here from Dragon. Okay, his question is: What are some of the most prominent problematic teachings in the traditional arts that you had to overcome and what were the gaping holes that you had to figure out to fill ah uh, very simple dogmatics mm. especially in the japanese system that uh of goju everything in the school was taught in japanese number one so i had to overcome that yeah number two everything had a eastern budo mindset that was okay. another thing that I had a lot of problems with. I'm a okay. Westerner. Uh, the whole concept of Budo to me is foreign. I don't like it. I don't understand it. And I don't accept it. Mm. And so I had a lot of problems. My instructor was the type of guy because he learned it there. And for him, it wasn't that hard. For me, I was like, what? You know, and then the idea that you could only teach to a certain level and you must remain at this level and you must not do any other thing but this, what I'm teaching you until I tell you that you are ready to move forward. That type of mindset, to me, I was just like, dude, 
I'm I'm not here to be some Zen Buddhist monk. I'm here to be a better fighter. Yeah, yeah. to be a bit to be a more competent man with my empty hands or whatever. Mm -hmm. And after I had gotten stabbed, I explained this to my instructor, and I asked him to please help me with knife defense of some sort. He had no clue because in his mind, knife defense was something that was so far up here. You had to be so far up here that why would you worry yourself with it down here? Well, my proof was I just got stabbed. <laughs> and so when I when I went into Pekiti Tership, it caused a major rift between him and I, which caused oh, our yeah. boom. Well, he actually that. dismissed me from his karate school because I was going against that dogmatic teaching that I am also studying this outside of that. Okay. <clears throat> that was the worst part about it. The Wing Chun, not so much. Because after the Goju experience, I learned. And I sought only Wing Chun guys out to teach me that were eclectic. Mm. That, were not, that were not collectors of dogmatics, but they were collectors of truth. And this works yeah. here. Let me help you work it for you. Emin Bustepi was one. I trained with Emin quite a bit when he would come. He was the first guy who taught me, be you, man. You're a big dude. Smack him. Smash him. Do this. Let me yeah, show you how to right. work this better. You know, Scott Baker, do this, man. Look, you're as big as me, dude. He used to, he was six foot four, 290 pounds. Wow. And he would, he would, he, he could kill you with a fudge sickle. But he was the sweetest guy in the world, you know, but he was the type of guy, oh, that's not going to work for you. You know, let, let, let's see if we can make, make that work better for you. Hmm. And that's how, and from that point on, everything I learned from that point on was that open-mindedness of let, let's try to make this fit the guy and i picked that up for my own teaching let's make this fit him no dogmatics man karate is karate goju is goju why do i have to why do i have to buy into all the hoopla and the tradition with it i'm not that yeah i'm mike from san antonio texas i'm not somebody you know i'm, I'm not you know that. it goes back to what we were saying like the student and the individual being the most important part of the equation. Like, you know, when I meet folks that like when they're pushing them or their system and it that overbearing, like alarms start going off with me. Like, cause now yeah. the student is not, you know, so. Yeah. It's, it, 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 and it doesn't behoove anybody, you know, I don't think so. I yeah. mean, I, I won't train with, I mean, I've walked out of training sessions, uh, you know, guys want to do a private lesson with me and stuff, and I accept them as a private lesson student. I had a guy come to me the first private lesson. I said, well, yeah, okay. And I asked him, I said, what are you actually interested? And he told me, I want to learn how to kill with a knife. I handed him his <laughs> money back, and I said, take care. I, wow. Yeah, there's an alarm. Huh? <laughs> yeah, there's. A, I, what are you talking about? You come into my house, and I'm because I teach private. I built my garage into my school. Yeah. And I was like, that, what? <laughs> You know, I said, you can't even afford it, but yet you want to kill somebody with a knife, then you don't need me. Just go sneak up on somebody and ruin your own life. It's oh, not hard. Gosh. But like you said, Hollywood, uh, very, very weak people. Mm. A lot of men are very, very weak. A lot of men, they, they're they're uh, they're dying for it. They're they're wanting it so bad, it's not even funny. You yeah, know? It's just and, bizarre. Like, yeah, that's something. Like, yeah, much to your point. Like, uh, yeah, I'm not your guy. <laughs> yeah, I'm not your guy, man. I got the... Uh, if you want to come well, around, I'm, yeah, I'm going to start you with footwork and we'll see how bad your feet hurt after the first hour. Yeah, after, yeah, one hour, you just move around. Then you know they're not coming back anyhow. Yeah. So. Or I'll put a long pole in their hands and I'll, I'll give them three exercises of long pole for 20 minutes. Yeah. And, and then we'll then we'll see. We'll judge your conditioning there and then we'll, we'll take it from there. Because if I can't see your conditioning right off, yeah, I, I got to start you somewhere. So why am I starting you up the chain when you're very, as a private student or as a regular student, First thing I start people on is I got to see where you're at. I got to see what kind of condition. If you're grabbing knees within 30 seconds, well, now I got a problem because now I got to start you somewhere to get you from not grabbing your knees because you're yeah, so out of yeah. shape. So my whole, all my teaching now is going to start breaking down footwork. So now I get, I get you moving. I teach you how to breathe a little better, you know, nose breathing only type of stuff. Uh, I put a lot of yogic breathing in the stuff to, just to help people move better. Because mm -hmm. if, if you're uh, uh, after 20 seconds, what, what good is it for me to teach you blah, 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 all these? It doesn't mm -hmm. matter, you know? It doesn't yeah. matter. You got to start people, you know, the right way, you know? That's just the way I look at it.
No, no, I, I think no, I think agree. Like you're right. I think exactly. If they're panting at 20 seconds into it, um, yeah, <laughs> you're not going to get very. I, I've so had guys. Uh, I do what they call a long bridge drill, where I have mm. you in the open horse stance, you know, side by side here, and with your wusa here, here, and you just pop the horse and push the hand out, stretch the back out, stretch the back out, you know, because you're stretching this out, and it's just mm. one side, and then you switch to the other side. I've had students that come in and within a minute. They can't hold their arm up because number one, it's something they've never done. Mm. Number two, they tell themselves they can't do it. And number three, they're, they're horrible shape. And I'm not oh. talking to old guys. I'm talking, I've had some young guys come in here and they're just like, after a 35 minutes or 40 minutes, I have them sit down because I look at them and I can just see they're ticking like a rabbit, man. <laughs> you know, so you have, you have to really be, as a teacher, you have to be cognitive of that. Because if not, and something happens at your place. Yeah, right. Like you pushed them too hard. And yeah. And, and here again, now we go back to society's norms. Yeah, that's true. You know? Mr. Blackgrave, how come you kept pushing him? <laughs> right? And if I pop off with some smart-ass ego, well, we're a warrior academy. Oh, and I put know. your hands behind your back, sir. Yeah, you no know? pain. Yeah, the old no pain, no gain. Nah, that, that, yeah, that's bullshit. I mean, if you have students who are down with that and you built them up to that, okay, cool. Yeah. You know, my guy Dusty, I could bang with him all day. But you know what? I couldn't do that when I first had him. Yeah, sure, sure. I've had him now going on in his fourth year, third year, fourth year, and now I can bang with him because he's really big and he's really strong and fit and he likes it now. You know, he's 34, he likes it. I'm okay. I, but when I get other guys in here, I got to back it down, you know? Yeah. Because yeah. not, people get hurt. And they, even when I work dusty with some of my other guys, I'll have to tell, hey, back it down a little bit, man. Back it down. You guide them. Don't let them guide you. Don't, don't let your ego guide you. Understand who they are. They're not where you're at. Help yeah. them get to where you need to be, where they need to be. Yeah. Yeah, right. So they're having a liability on your hand. You yeah, know, I'm, I'm a big it. proponent of letting my students help when they get to a certain level. If I get new guys in, I'll, Dusty, take this guy here. I want you to work him on his horse. Because, mm. number one, it teaches Dusty how to teach. Number two, Dusty's going to see all the mistakes he made. And now he's going to be able to correct those mistakes in that person because not because I corrected him in him. And so he becomes a better teacher, you know. Mm. And so he sees it and he feels it. Oh, this, and he even told me, see, for now I see where I was making that mistake. Yeah, now you see. Now you know how to mm. correct it because you felt the mistakes. You see the mistakes. Now fix the mistakes. Awesome, awesome, awesome. You know, that's the way I am with that. I mean, it, I, I like, you know, it's family to me, man. He, he's a good kid. He brings his big cane corso. My mom feeds him. We play with the dog. And she, make, she makes all my students cookies at Christmas and all kinds of stuff. Oh, that's nice. Oh, that's nice. You know, thing. we're not, I, this, the, you know, my Ludus and my training hall, we, we go at it. We bang. We have fun. But at the end of the day, man, we're not, we're not getting ready to walk down the streets of Fallujah. <laughs> None of us are going to war. I know that whole thing. I mean, yeah. it's, just, it's like an activity. We're being the best version of ourselves. I mean, yeah. enjoying yeah. having folks that we have a commonality and put, making yeah. ourselves better. But, but yeah, the, good, but but the byproduct of that, if the world does go boobs up, you got something. Yeah, God forbid somebody did, but I mean, it's like my first thing when I exit this door, I'm out of my house to go do something is that I'm not, oh, yeah, you know, I'm preparing for two weeks. There's going to be, you know, we're going to be invaded. And <laughs> yeah, but you know what? That type of sell stuff sells and so many people buy into it, oh. uh, especially in the gun industry is the worst thing, man. I mean, I teach a lot of gun. But I see people doing these courses with these former special operations guys. And no offense to these guys. They know what the hell they're doing. But I asked a lot of these guys, are you in shape for that? <laughs> to run with these guys? I mean, tell me the scenario where you're going to be in a four-man stack cutting through a door with nods. You know, I, I use the story of my buddy who uh, spent $5,000 for a helicopter sniper course. Mm. And he was a Costco manager. And I told him. I said, dude, you work at Costco. You got like three kids. Five grand for a sniper course from a chopper? Really? And I said, how did your wife, you know, she was really pissed after I got home. Well, yeah. I wonder why. $5,000. I mean, shit, I get air sick. I get air sick, you know, my in my damn truck, man. I'm not going to no chopper to shoot. Oh, yeah. That's just crazy. I, mean, I, teach, I teach basic pistol because guess what? Pistol is our weapon. I mean, that's what a man, yeah. that's what I carry. 
Mm -hmm. uh, the whole idea of fighting to, to get to your rifle is bullshit. I mean, I mean, I understand the premise of it, but let's be honest. If I'm out in the street with my daughter and I'm in the mall and I got my gun on me, do you honestly think I'm going to take that pistol to go fight to get to my rifle? Or am I going to use that pistol to get my daughter the hell out of there? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's, common, it's yeah. common sense. You know, it's, it's just common sense. So many people are looking for the uh, Rambo moment and it don't come, man. Again, back to the it theater. Come, it don't come like you think. Yeah, the glorification, whether it's through the theater, cinema, or something yeah. that we lacked when we were growing up, and now yeah. we're living vicariously through these, you know, people. But yeah. you know, the pit, I can imagine a gun community. I'm nowhere as familiar with the gun community as you are, but I'm seeing the knife world too. You yeah. know what I mean? You need to have three or four on you, and you need to know when to go here and not and just, but nothing about the ramifications maybe of doing that or looking maybe at the other possibilities which you could use instead of that yeah. you know? i carry uh my daily carry I, I have a little tiny uh old emerson i got uh and i carry that in my right pocket that's more of a that's more of your box over in your cutter you know stuff mm -hmm. like that and uh when the need be when i go to places where i think something may happen I carry my uh, one of my blades, my good blades, usually my Williams design that I bought, which I love that blade. Mm -hmm. And uh, I carry that because it carries so nice. And when it comes to firearms, I'm usually carrying my SIG uh, six, six hour and two magazines. Mm -hmm. You know, do I carry a carbine in the car? Am I traveling? If I'm traveling, then maybe, yeah. But if mm -hmm. I'm not traveling, you know, it's usually, uh, no, I, you know, it's just me because my whole thing is that OODA loop, like we talked about the other day. There's three O's in that bad boy. Oh shit! Observe, orient, <laughs> decide, and act. You know, yeah, and, if there, and if I feel any, and if I feel any type of tangent that's weird, I'm yeah. not going there, and I'm never going to put my daughter in harm's way. Yeah, I'm right, not gonna, right. You know, I'm going to use my mind the whole time. And when we go to a restaurant, I'm sitting to a position where I can see it all. And if I yeah, think yeah. something's shady, let's go, honey. Let's yeah, go, yeah, honey. right, right. Yeah, something doesn't. I don't, I don't sit there, put her in places, and I don't put myself into these harm's way places at two o'clock in the morning where shit can pop off i don't need that trouble no no but yeah no especially when children are playing you got no, kids. No. no yeah exactly so what's the um, good i ever have to, i don't want to ever hurt somebody i mean i've done enough of that in my life I'm, no i know that's you know, i don't want that yeah yeah exactly like when we get old yeah like yeah that's yeah. Not, i don't wake up at this you know, my goal to hurt your eyes so what you, what's the future for you? Like, what do you, uh, what's the future hold for you? Like, far well, as you, you know, basically, you know, it's uh, the last seven years since her passing was, uh, was this odd trying to find myself again, you know, going through all the turmoils. You know, I had two kids who lost their mother, I lost my wife, and it's taken us a long, long time to oh, kind man. of get grips with all that, you know. And there's been ups and there's been downs. My daughter dealt with anxiety, and my son, and you know, that grief and that loss. And uh, in that time, I was found in holy orthodoxy, the Christian church, and I've become orthodox. And uh, that's helped me a whole lot. You know, my priest, Father Wooten, has done magic with me because I was just a boss meth. And basically, you know, I got my daughter and her and I talk about a lot of stuff. My son's out on his own now doing his own thing. He's moving to Colorado. We got a great job up there. Fantastic. Pray for him. And I basically told her, she goes, Dad, um, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? And I said, well, I said, my goals are this year to get my uh, certification, my personal fitness certification to help people teach. I want to start helping older folks and I want to mm. start helping younger folks uh, with fitness, with stretching. Uh, I'm going to start working towards a kettlebell certification as well so I can teach mm. that. And she goes, what about your martial arts? Are you still going to teach? And I said, yeah, I'll still teach. And I'm hoping to get back out there on the workshop trail, the seminar trail, if anybody wants to train with me. Sure. So just keep plugging away at it, you know, and just get better across the board. And I do uh, this year intend to start learning uh, Aishinru uh, Iaido, the Japanese Iaido. I've always wanted to learn the katana, the traditional way. Oh, okay. And uh, you remember the old books, Flashing Steel? Flashing Steel. <laughs> well, uh, Mr. Pellman, who wrote those books with Shimabuku, his teacher, opened up a dojo right up the road from me. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I'm going to contact him and... Uh, I want to go up there and learn the sword, you know, if, if for yeah. nothing more than just have fun and to learn. Yeah, exactly. something, just keep you know? invested in something, learning yeah. something, you know, and I just plan on uh, doing that and teaching. And uh, 
I've been contemplating going back and taking some courses in college and uh, because I got a little community college right here. And there's a whole lot of stuff going through my mind what I'm going to do. But, uh, you know, she's growing up and my main priority is her because, you know, Mm. at 15 years of age, she needs her dad big time. Oh, yeah. Especially today's society. She keeps asking me if I'm ever going to get remarried and if I'm ever going to have another girlfriend. And I tell her, I said, honey, you make it sound so easy. (laughs) I said, I said. First off, I'm not the easiest person to be around. I'm not the easiest man to live with. <laughs> you, you could ask your mother about that. Yeah. Uh, and I said, uh, for me, I said, if it, God intends it and it happens, it happens. But if so not, I said, I said, I'm so, so be it. I, if I'm if I end up single the rest of my life, so be it. And mm-hmm. Just because I'm alone doesn't mean I'm lonely. Like I said, I got a wall of books back here. Right. You know, my, my life is I, my life is good. I love to read and I love my coffee and I love my family. And I just like helping people, teaching people, and just trying to be the best person I can be. That's well, that's what I'm, you're doing. It. I mean, you know. so it's uh, based on everything you're just saying right here, or, you know. Yeah. And I mean, that's it's, a great thing. It's not Thank the same people. Mike that I was years and years ago. A lot of people mm-hmm. they uh, talk to me now, and they don't even like, dude, you're so different. Well, I hope really, so. I hope so, because I wasn't a very good person in my life at certain stages of my mm-hmm. life. I was. I was a pretty vile individual and I did a lot of bad things. I did a lot of bad stuff to people that I've tried to make amends for the rest of my life, you know, cause there's things that, uh, I still got to wonder about the statute of limitations on some stuff I pulled, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> I worry about stuff, but from here on out, man, I'm just going to my whole, my whole thing in life is I, I want to help folks, you know, and yeah. I want to help my kids and I just want to be a good guy. That's all. That's all. Yeah, man. That's no, that's great. You're looking at improving people's fitness. Yeah. Give them some core defensive skills, God forbid, what their yeah. needs are, and uh, yeah. time the two together. Or, mm. you know, a lot of times people just want to talk. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. I've, I've had a tremendous lo- loss in my life with my wife, which is a crushing loss. And I've told people many, many times who've been in that situation, dude, you need a shoulder. You just need to talk. Call me. Yeah. I've been there. I, I know what you're feeling. I know what yeah. you're feeling. And so if, if I can help you in any way, shape, or form, man, just pick up the phone. I'm here. You know? Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, your students are lucky to have you. I mean, so um, you got a website or like how, no, you know, if folks no, would look I have, you No, off. I just have my Facebook and my Instagram. And uh, uh, Court Bolton and I are talking about putting some stuff together. He's my buddy out. Of, I think you had him on the show a long time ago. Who's that? He's a buddy of mine out of Colorado that uh, uh, we're talking about putting uh the B and B program together, Blackberry Bolton program, because we do a lot of the same similar stuff. And we've been talking about that and see, we're going to see what we can do throughout this year, putting some group seminars together. Oh, you guys should, that would be really neat. You guys put a tour together or something like yeah. that. And, yeah, uh, and it's two different perspectives. He has that heavy, heavy, uh, army ranger, you know, idealism. And he's very good at what he does. His, his gun work is my God, spooky. His, mm. uh, his, his knife works good. His empty hands are real good. He's a big, strong guy. And, I come from the other aspect. I come from that kind of that dirty, greasy street level type of stuff, you know. So we put stuff together. That's a just, good, you know, yeah, good yeah, marriage it there. Well. Yeah, it hurts as well. But yeah, so yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens cool. there. And other than that, I'm just, you know, like I said, I'm just trying to get my name back out there. I kind of fell off the grid for a lot of years, and now I'm back, and I'm bigger and stronger and fitter than ever. So I'm ready to roll. Whoever wants to come work should, with um, bring me in, I'm ready to go. Yeah, you know, don't hesitate to share your stuff in FMA discussion. I mean, like, yeah. you know, folks have gotten, like, seminar work out of there. I mean, students, yeah. I mean, getting their name out there. Don't hesitate to put your stuff in there, you know. Yeah, um, yeah, um, yeah this interview will go in there as well, you know, when, when I'm, after I download it. But uh, so for for folks now, though, when you say your Facebook, like, do you have just just your personal page? Yeah, or under Michael Blackgrave. That's all. I don't, I'm thinking about building something else. I'm uh, I've been I've been I'm not very computer savvy, so I need to have my daughter get off her cell phone for about an hour to show me what to do. <laughs> I'm not very computer savvy. Well, I mean, it took, me five, it took me five minutes to figure this out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. But what I was like, you should have like a page, like you know, everything you do yeah. on your system, so folks can go your they could go to the yeah. Facebook page. Yeah, yeah, that's what she said too. So I'm gonna have her help me with that. No, that's awesome, awesome. And Jaime, I mean, so you see Jaime at all, or every once in a while? I I see him once in a while. I'm supposed to be coming down there, Jaime. If you're listening, get off your butt, man, and bring me back down there, man. You got some stuff to learn. 
So, yeah. you know, like I said, he's an hour and a half away. I love going down to see him. because oh, it's not that bad then. Okay. Dude, it's some of the best barbacoa and some of the best Mexicano food. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And I then know. he always treats us right when we go down there. He he throws on a nice banquet for us. And uh, yeah. we always train real hard. It's it's a good time. Yeah, he's a good guy. Yeah. yeah he's good. Him. He's, uh, I like his, uh, I like a lot of his views, too. I mean, he's yeah. a good guy. Yeah. You know, he's like, he's uh, a dad. He gets it. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, for one hundred percent. Basically, what he's seen every day. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. He's yeah. right there in it. Yeah, I know. That's a whole other. <laughs> uh, don't, don't get me started. That's I know, man. We man, we're both gonna go down a rabbit hole on that one. Oh That's, yeah. Don't get me started, man. But hey, I this has been awesome. I appreciate you coming on. I, I really oh, my do. pleasure. My pleasure. I had a good time. Anytime you want me, just holler. Oh yeah, no, I'll I'll find a reason. Not. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get you and some of the other uh, guys on, like you, uh, Brian, you and Brian, man, that would be a good combination. You, Brian, you know, yeah. um, and whoever, like you on, yeah, definitely, yeah. I always bring guy folks back on, especially when they're really good conversations like this, where folks are actually learning something or giving a different perspective on something. You know, As a matter right. of fact, Emmanuel just said, "Great, great talk, yeah, great conversation." But yeah, let's stay in touch, man, for sure. Like, let me know if you if you get that tour going or what's going on with yeah. that. You know, or if you want to bring me up there, man, I will come up to see you. I'm, I'm, yeah. Matter of fact, who we do? Uh, we're bringing Tom Sotis. He's okay. coming back up. He just moved Excellent. to Florida. Excellent. Luckily, Florida. Yeah, yeah. You know what? Absolutely. Like, just. Do the like. Let me know like wh how you structure like you know your two day, your one day, or whatever you're going. Uh, yeah, I usually uh, when I when I travel, I like to I, I do two and a half for the price of two, because usually on Friday night I like a meet and greet and we'll work out for like two three hours, so I get the feel of all the people that are coming, and then the next day I'm not one of those guys who teach a ton of stuff, man. Day one, I'm going to structure it uh, a lot of footwork, a lot of intricate little things that you need to know. Hands go here, this goes here. Now we're going to go transcend system. We're going to take it from knife to this, to that, to that. Hmm. <clears throat> Day two, we're going to put it all together. We'll go a little live with it. And next thing you know, you're going to learn maybe one or two, three things, but you'll be able to do those one, two or three things. That's what take I love. It, make it yours. I'm telling you, that's what I love. Like you get a few things and then, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, yeah, that, yeah. That's, that fits my wheelhouse. Like, Cause if yeah. I sit there and say, you know, I've been to seminars where guys are teaching like 28 things and nothing. Yeah, can I yeah. come out of there with my head smoking, like, man, what did I do? What, yeah, I don't remember I do? anything. Yeah. I can't do that. No, I can't either. Yeah, no, no. I couldn't even do it back then, let alone now. No, nah, me no. neither. But it wasn't, I couldn't do it. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Yeah, awesome. I'd, I'd love to come up. You're in New Jersey, yeah? Connecticut. Connecticut, yeah. The tax state. The tax state. The I've never tax, been to Connecticut. We'll tax you. In fact, we're going to tax you just for coming up. <laughs> <laughs> All like I said, man, I, all I need is a good delicate test and when I get there. Well, we, I tell you what people don't know. We have, uh, we're really known for our pizza. Oh, yeah, I bet. I bet. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to come Even, up. I've never been to Connecticut. I'd love to come up and yeah. work up there. Don't get you, man. Get off the plane. <laughs> That's yeah. Awesome, awesome. But uh, yeah, let's definitely stay in touch. I'm glad you're back. Social media, everybody was saying, well, where'd he go? He disappeared. And uh, But obviously, you're back. And um yeah, so awesome. Let definitely stay in touch and uh you take care, man. All right. God bless everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Awesome. Peace. Take um, care. <laughs> awesome. That wraps up for four yeah, four fifty eight. Four fifty eight. Jesus, I can't even say that correctly. Um oh, future episodes. Brian Canada will be coming on. I'm gonna be really excited about this episode. We're gonna be talking about lineage lineage and how it also can cross over to factions in other words can you teach it are you allowed to teach it or is it political to me that's kind of falls under the breath of lineage also the whole thing with lineage do you take lineage seriously does it govern you and your how what you teach how you teach or are you or somebody else that you don't really take lineage too seriously you know it's you're still giving a great product you you just don't value as much. So again, I don't think there's any correct answer in this, but I do think it's worth looking at for sure. And again, in its relation to where lineage can become kind of toxic potentially. We're gonna to go into that.
you know, where folks abuse it, you weaponize it. Oh, imagine that weaponizing it. What do I mean by that? Well, you try to control others teaching. Yeah, stuff like that. We're going to be going over. So that will be pretty soon. In addition to upcoming episodes besides that, Kirk Cromwell next Wednesday will be coming on. He's going to be a new feller coming on here. And also Lameko SD, Roger Abulis' faction. We're going to have Stephanie, Roger, and Heil. That should be pretty interesting. Give some Lameko some more exposure. But... So Kirk Cromwell, and I have to work out a date with Brian Canada because I want to get into this lineage stuff. I just love those guys when I try to weaponize it. You know what I mean? Hell yeah. I'll be right here to freaking try to go right up against you. So at any rate, stay tuned. And those of you who watch, thank you. And I will be downloading this vid, posting it to FMA Discussion. Yeah, uh, Mike Blackrave, that was inspiring so to speak, uh, what he's about and what he's doing. Yeah, I like it. I like it a lot. And a uh, big thank you to Brian Canada for referencing him. I didn't realize uh, Mike was back in social media until uh, Brian made me aware of that. So big thanks to him. All right, folks, we'll see you next time.